Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. If you have your copy of God's Word, turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and we'll look at that in just a few moments. If you've been with us for the last few weeks, you know we've been talking about uh, being anchored in faith and how important it is that we're anchored in faith. And I'm so glad just to, to see you on this redneck holiday. And... Uh, <laughs> You either uh, didn't go hunting, you're not going hunting, or you got your deer or whatever, but you, you can tell how redneck you are on the opening weekend of deer season in church, right? When, when we lived in South Missouri, Tammy and I, I, I'd always call it the redneck holiday, and, and uh, well, down there, you know, uh, you, you really were redneck because uh, most of the ushers' names were nicknamed Bubba, and you took the offering with hubcaps, and, and uh, it was just a whole different thing, but... Uh, uh, I'm glad to see anybody today, really. Uh, uh, you just never know how it's going to turn out. But Being anchored in faith. I hope that uh, it's resonated with you over these weeks as we've talked about how important it is to live a life where you're stretched, right? How important it is to be willing to be stretched and to be in a position where you've got to trust God and you're not living life like this. This, a, this is not a life that you want to live. You're not going to experience God. You're not going to experience His power in your life. You're, 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 going to, you're going to be in a bad way. But when you live here, you're going to live a life where, I, I mean, it, it's going to be a life, it's, it's going to be challenging, but God's going to do something. He's going to show up in your life and in your circumstances because He's got you in a place where you've got to rely on Him. And that's exactly where he wants us to be. We've been looking at this verse every single Sunday. Verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 11. Look at it with me. And it's impossible to please God without faith. In other words, God wants to be trusted. And we've walked down through these verses and looked at the, the different... Um, Examples that are mentioned in this faith hall of fame that it's often, often called in Hebrews 11. And we've just seen a number of different ones where, where God's Word says, okay, this one, by faith they did this, by faith they did that. And there are all kinds of different examples. And it kind of gave me this thought this week. Who's going to be the next faith hero? Who's going to be the next one that says, God, I, I'm going to trust you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live a life stretched and I'm going to trust you. My faith's not going to be in my, myself and my faith is not going to be in faith. But my faith is in you. I'm going to trust you. I want to read you a poem that I wrote, or no, uh, Carrie Miller wrote. It's a good poem. talks about all these examples of faith in Hebrews 11. By faith it's called. Abraham was never shaken. Enoch walked and then was taken. Abel's blood still tells the story. Noah floated on to glory. Baron Sarah nursed a child even though she good as died. Isaac faced his father's knife yet lived to ordain Jacob's life. And when old Israel was fading, lo, he bowed and worshipped, waiting. Moses' parents didn't quiver when they hid him in the river. Moses forsook Nile riches, golden scepters, royal stitches. Split the sea and walked on dry ground, Pharaoh's charioters were all drowned. Joseph's bones were carried out after Egypt's ten plague rout. Rahab on two spies took pity, then God's people stomped the city. Walls came down and trumpet winds, Rahab safe beside her friends. How much more there is to say, faithful heroes make the way. Barak, Gideon, Jephthah, Samson paid in part their people's ransom. Samuel's wisdom gave men's pause, Daniel shut the lion's jaws. Kings were conquered, armies taken, weakness turned to strength unshaken. Women welcomed back their dead, raised to life from death's deep dread. There were others tortured, gro tortured, groaning, beat, and put to death by stoning. Sawed in two or killed by sword, they still believed in their reward. In this world they were mistreated, destitute, and seemed defeated. But all isn't what it seems, they kept the faith 
and dream their dreams, that one day they would see God's pledge that drew them on beyond life's edge. And hear these words, sincere and fervent, Welcome home, my favorite, my faithful servant. That's good stuff, isn't it? That's good. Well, today we're going to go on and we're going to finish up our series on Anchored in Faith and talk about a forward-looking faith. A forward-looking faith. And I want you to read these verses with me and they'll come up on the screen starting in verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 11. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. Let's talk about a forward-looking faith. That's what the writer of Hebrews said that these, these had in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11. They, they looked forward. They looked beyond this life. They weren't just living for the here and now. They realized this world isn't it. It's all going to go up in smoke. It, it, it's not going to last for eternity. And, and as we talk about the future, isn't it hard, even as believers, to, to keep that in perspective? Because we all got to leave here today. We go out into a week and we've got our jobs to do. We've got bills to pay. We've got battles to fight. We've got things going on. Some of you have kids and God forbid you have teenagers and, and, and things like that. And it's just hard. Life is hard. And, and it's hard to keep an eternal perspective when we got to deal with life right now, isn't it? You would think that as the years go by in our walk with God and in our journey with Him, that the more years we get under our belt walking with God, that it would become more easy to think about eternity. But it just seems like that, that it becomes more difficult because we, we, we seem to become more rooted in this world. And as we live as though this is it when it's really not it. So we're going to talk about some things that really aren't very fun to talk about today as we talk about a forward-looking faith. And Tammy and I were talking this morning. I said, I think I'll just move the pulpit, give me a chair, and just sit down and have a talk. Didn't work out so good in first service. I got up. But uh, uh, I'm going to try my hardest. It's been said, and surveys say this. I read a survey this week. The four most unpopular sermon topics are these. Number one, politics. Well, we're not going to talk about that one, so rest of we, might, we will someday because it kind of talks about it in God's Word. But anyway, we're not going to talk about that today. Number two is death. Number three is hell. Number four is sin. Nobody wants to come to church and hear about what they're doing wrong. Right? Anybody want to hear about that? Well, the bad news is we are going to talk about those last three. We're going to talk about death. We're going to talk about what happens when you die. We're going to talk about hell. And we're going to talk about sin. Sin. So I'm going to be even more unpopular than what I normally am, you know, by the end of the, uh, the service. And you know what, I, I, at this point, after 30 years of doing it, I really don't care. <laughs> it, it means squat to me. It, doesn't, it just doesn't matter. I just want to be faithful. And what would be a tragedy is for me to get to the end of my life and be accountable because I did not share the whole counsel of God's Word. And I didn't talk about the hard things. So we're going to talk about the hard things this morning. Because it has everything to do with our faith. And having a forward-looking faith on out into eternity. 
because this life is not it. So I want you to see the first thing about a forward-looking faith. First of all, a person with a forward-looking faith, and it'll come up on the screen, understands that you're destined to die. Aren't you glad you came to church to hear that today? To hear me say, you are going to die. The stats are pretty compelling. Right? Unless the Lord comes back first, and He could, every person in this room eventually is going to get to a time in your life when you're going to breathe your last breath and you're going to exit this world. You are going to die. Hebrews 9 and verse 27 says this, It's appointed unto every man. It's destined. It's predetermined. You have an appointment. And and when, when you die, it will not be an accident. It will be an appointment. You have an appointment with death. And then will come the judgment. And we'll talk about it in just a few minutes. I was reading through 1 Samuel this week. And I came to this verse in 1 Samuel Chapter 20 and verse 3. Look at what David said when he was talking to Jonathan. He said, Jonathan, there is but a step between me and death. And you never know when you're going to take that step. Because there's some people here and you say, well, you know what? I'm young. I'm not going to die. One of the saddest funerals, probably the saddest funeral I ever preached. And it had to do with some of the people in our church. Several years ago, I preached the funeral of a young mom and her two children in little bitty white caskets on each side of her because they were killed over at Meanville Junction. I preached my nephew's 17 year he was 17 years old I preached his funeral after he kissed his mom goodbye ran out the house went through an intersection and was killed 17 years old yesterday I preached the funeral of an 89 year old Vietnam vet hero great man he had a great long life and that's the thing Death comes sometimes slow. To others it comes fast. To to one person it, it comes when they're young. To another person it comes when they're old. I can't explain that. I don't have that answer. I can point you to what David said in Psalm 139. He said, you saw me, Lord, before I was born. And every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. So God knew when I was going to be born. He knew me before I was physically born. He knew me while I was still in my mother's womb. And He knows the day I'm going to die. I have that appointment. And here's the thing. So do you. You are going to die. I went on, uh, you can get on it if you want to, deathclock.com. And you can put in some information about yourself. And here's what it told me. I'm going to die on April the 14th, 2037. So I've got 17 more years to torment you. (laughs) And I'm going to do it with every fiber of my being. I don't put a lot of stock in that. But I do know I'm going to die. I know that day is coming. And I say it like this sometimes. You say, man, this is really morbid. But I want to tell you something. It's true because I've seen it happen time and time again after preaching hundreds of funerals. The flowers in the floral shop today may be on your casket before the end of the week. 
You say, oh, that won't. How do you know? You're just a step between you and death. It kind of puts things in perspective. Your problem that you classify as your greatest problem may not be your greatest problem. If this isn't settled, this is a far greater problem than anything you've got going on. You and I are going to die. And as it relates to faith, here, here's the deal. Whether or not that settles what... When you hear me say that, and you have a peace, and that you're, you're settled, and you say, okay, that, that's all right. And I... I don't think anybody is just looking to, to die, looking forward. You know, I, I, I want to hang around. But you know what? If, if it does happen today, it's okay. Kevin's going to be just fine. I do not fear it. But as it relates to faith, the acid test for your faith is, do you have a peace when we talk about this subject? And that's what I want to do. Somebody came up to me at the end of the first service and they said, man, I just liked it. You just sitting down and talking. It just seemed like we were in your office and you were just talking to me. And you said, are you okay? Are you ready? And I wish I could have that private conversation with every one of you. Are you ready? Are you, are you okay about dying? Do you have a peace? Do you have a forward-looking faith that has prepared you for that day when it comes that you will die? Let me show you a second thing here. If you have a forward-looking faith, it means you're delighted about your destination. That, that's the case with these that we read about in Hebrews 11. They were delighted, not just about living this life here. And you know what? Life is abundant here. I, I, I love, Paul said, and we're going to look at this verse in a few moments, but he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know what? I love living my life for Christ. I love just walking with Him and experiencing life with Him. It's abundant. It, it, I'm telling you, it's worth living. But just like these in Hebrews 11, they had a destination they were headed for that really drew them like a magnet. They knew their destination. Now I want you to back up with me and think about this. Let's dig into this just a little bit further. Broke the ice, right? Here's the, here's the deal. What was the first thing? You're going to die. Here's the second thing. Your physical body is going to be lifeless. But you are going to live on. You are not going to cease to exist when you breathe your last breath. There are many passages in Scripture that illustrate that truth, but I want to show you two of them, can I? I'm going to anyway. Just thought I'd be polite. You know, that's just me. I want to be polite. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel. He said, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. In other words, anybody that you would encounter on the face of this earth, they can't touch your soul. Fear only God who what can destroy both soul and body in hell. So Jesus is alluding to the fact that every person is made up of two things. You do not need a physical body in order to exist. You exist whether you have a body or not. Because you are not just your body. You are technically your soul. That real you, that seed of your being, that... that, that, that place where, where you really live and from where you really live. Your seat of your will. Your soul lives on forever. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, look at what he said. For then the dust will return to the earth and the Spirit will return unto God who gave it. 
In other words, you're, you're, you're just going to go back. Here, here's what's going to happen when you die. Most of us, unless you're cremated, they're going to put your body in a hole in the ground. You're going to go back to dust. That's reality, right? Your body is. But you have a soul that's going to live on forever and ever 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 and ever. Do you get the point? You're not going to cease to exist when you die. And that truth is illustrated throughout the Bible. Now, Jesus addressed that. He told the story in Luke 16, and I'll flip over there. Luke 16, of two people who died. And what happened to them? And here's, here's what I want to talk to you about. Look back up here. We've already said you're going to die. Now, uh, here's what I want to talk to you about. What is going to be reality for you five minutes after you die? I'm talking before the, the family even cuts into the ham that they're going to have at your family, uh, your, your funeral dinner, okay? By the time they cut into the ham, you're already somewhere. Before... Scott Lindley might pull the sheet over your head. <laughs> You're already somewhere. Five minutes after you die. What's going to be reality for you? Here's what I can tell you. What's going to be reality is what it was for either one of these two characters that Jesus talks about in this story. You are in this story. And what's going to be reality is either one or the other. Let's read it together. Luke 16. Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen, and who lived each day in luxury. In other words, he had everything in this life. He had a house to go home to. He had riches. He had possessions. He had it made in this life. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried to the angels uh, by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. There in torment he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers and I want him to warn them so they won't end up in this place of torment. Let's talk about it. The first character was a rich man. He had things in this life, but what he didn't have was a forward-looking faith. He didn't think about five minutes after he died. And here's what Jesus said. And guys, could I say this? It may not be well liked what I'm sharing with you, but if you can look in here and see the truth of what I'm sharing with you, don't you think we ought to get past not liking what we're hearing and get to truth? Amen. And so Jesus said, this, this rich man, he had everything in this life, but when he died, he went to hell.
Now here's, here's the problem. Here's the breakdown. What we want to do kind of at this point is close our Bibles and make a statement like this. One of two statements. Many people will close their Bible and say, well, you know what, I, I just believe in a loving God and there's no way a loving God would send anybody to hell. Ever heard it? Maybe you said it. And you can't reconcile the justice and the holiness of God. His love and His grace, the character of God with the reality of hell. So they close their Bible and they say this, you know what, I, I just can't accept that. I don't believe that there's hell. God, God of love wouldn't do that. And so what they really do is, is in reality, say, I, I'm going to go by what I think and trust that it's just going to be all right. Have you ever thought you might be wrong? If I were the devil... Some of you are thinking that's not a far stretch of the imagination. <laughs> if I were the devil, here's what I'd do. I'd do two things. I would try to convince you that there is no hell. And it's not a big deal. And the second thing I try to do is try to convince you that you're okay. Most Americans, 70 some percent of Americans believe in a real hell. But listen to this stat. One half of one percent, one half of one percent believe that they're actually going to hell. So in other words, here's what they're saying. There is a hell, but hell is for bad people. Really bad people. The Saddam Husseins, the, the, the Bin Ladens of the world, and, and people like that. There, there is a hell, but there, it's just for really bad people. And I'm not a really bad person. And that's where you're deceived. There are no good people. Right? Nobody's good. <laughs> You're not good, and I'm not good. What, it, can anybody say they've never sinned? There you go. If I were the devil, I, I'd just say, you know, hell, that's an exact, that, that's a illustration, that's mystery, that's imagination, that's a personification of evil, hell, Satan, and all that. And it's not. Jesus even said a lot. Matter of fact, let me show you some verses from Matthew's Gospel. Most people are going to hell. Look at what he said. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. Its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. Many! But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. <coughs> Many. Most. And here's the thing. I was thinking this week, uh, it's so sad that the church has gotten so silent about hell. And, and you know what? I can even see it on your faces as I talk about it this morning. You're, you're not, not worried about it.
Do you realize Jesus said more about hell than he did about heaven? So if we keep things in perspective, we should talk more about hell than we do about heaven. You know, one of the reasons I just wanted to sit and talk to you, because I don't want fear to be a motivator. I really don't. I don't want to try to manipulate you. I don't want to try to give you this. this I'm just trying to share truth with you. And, And here's the thing. It would tear me up if you could get to the end of your life and say, I didn't realize. I never heard it. There was no hell in the pulpit at life point. Really? Do you realize hell is an actual place? This rich man died and he went to hell. Now, it wasn't the eternal lake of fire like where all unbelievers are going to be for all eternity. But here's what hell is. Hell is separation from God. And he died and he went to that place where all unbelievers go right now, five minutes. As a matter of fact, it doesn't take five minutes. The split second after you die... All unbelievers go to that permanent place called hell. It's an actual place. That's why Jesus talked about it so much. It's not, it's, it's not a fairy tale. It's, it's real. You know, there is a, a place in, in Michigan, a town that's called hell. The name of the town is hell. Look it up. Google it. Don't look at me like that. Hell, Michigan. It's a real place. And there are people that you you can go there and you can buy souvenirs, t-shirts, coffee mugs, stuff stuff like that, that says, uh, I've been to hell and back. There are people that send their alimony checks through hell, Michigan, because they just want to mess with their, uh, (laughs) their, their (laughs) one they divorced. But but it's no joke. Hell is an actual place. Let me tell you something else. It's an awful place. It's a place of unending torment. It's a place of... Well, look at how Paul described it. 1 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. That was a test. (laughs) God will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. You hear that? Punish. They will be punished, how? With everlasting destruction. Shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. It's a place of eternal torment and destruction. Look at what this rich man suffered as you... Look at what happened to him when he died and went to hell. He, he, he was suffering in agony. And you know the interesting thing about what we read? The rich man did not complain that it wasn't fair. He knew it was fair. He was getting what he deserved. You know what tormented him? His mind thinking about the family that he was separated from? Can you imagine a family member, a dad, a husband, being separated from the wife and the children because he does not have a relationship with God? And they do. And forever and ever and ever, part of the worst torment of hell is, I'm never going to see them again. And your mind going back to opportunities just like this. I heard. I had the opportunity. The truth was presented. But the devil convinced me. It's not a big deal. You're okay. The worst torment would be your mind. It's an awful place. It's a terrible place of eternal punishment. But Lazarus died. He was a beggar. He didn't have anything in this world. He didn't even have his health. And he died, but what he did have was a forward-looking faith. 
And when he died, he didn't go to hell, he went to heaven. It wasn't anything of his doing, but he died and, and he went to heaven because he had placed his faith in the Lord. Paul talked about what it's like for the believer to die. Look at what he said in Philippians. Here's the perspective you can have if you're a believer. If you've got a forward living faith, looking faith, and, and, and you know that this world's not it, and you're preparing for five minutes after you die, here's what you could say. For me to live is Christ. If I live, it's great. But if I die, that's great too. It's gain. He said, if I'm going to go on living in the body, this means I can hang around and serve the Lord. What greater thing could you do with your life? But he said, I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's necessary for you that I remain in my body. Here's what the believer that has a forward-looking faith can say. Here's what you can say right now. Today, if you can say this with a peace in your heart, you've got a forward-looking faith. Death ain't no big deal. It's no big deal. Because I know that five minutes after I die, I'm already going to be in His presence. For to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, Paul said. It's one or the other for the believer. Either I'm here and I get to go on serving the Lord or I'm there and I'm at home with the Lord. Either way, it's all right. Man, that's good stuff, isn't it? It's win-win. It's not lose-win or win-lose. It's win-win. It's all right. <laughs> John the Revelator talked about in Revelation what heaven's going to be like. Look at this. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. And they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. And He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. You know what that means? No more separation. No more separation. No mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Oh man, heaven's going to be good. It's a perfect atmosphere because all, all sin is gone. All temptation is gone. All effects of the curse of this fallen world are gone. We're in the presence of the Lord in heaven. We're going to be healthy. We're going to be whole. We're going to be holy. You know, what scares me to death is that somebody would really know me. Because I know inside me how wretched I am. But in heaven, all that is gone. I am who I am apart from sin. We'll have new resurrected bodies. I'll have hair. <laughs> Probably won't recognize me. <laughs> I said this and shared this in the first service. I want to say it again. You know, Jamie, Paul's is... You talk about somebody with a faith. But Jamie has never seen anything in this life. I tell him, Jamie, you look just like me. We're, we're twins. We're buds. We're, <laughs> you're a good-looking fella. Jamie's first sight is going to be Jesus. I'm jealous. And here's what it is for the believer. Heaven is Jesus. That's what heaven is. 
Heaven is being with Jesus face to face. There's an old hymn we used to sing. Only faintly now I see Him with a darkling veil between. But a blessed day is coming when His glory shall be seen. Face to face I shall behold Him. Far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all His glory I will see Him by and by. That's going to be heaven seeing Jesus. And when I think about that, that makes me homesick. Tammy and I got news yesterday. All our kids, both of them, and our grandkids are going to be here Christmas Day in our home. <sighs> that made our day. Because we get homesick when we don't see our family. I get homesick. I'm so tired of junk in this world. I'm so tired of seeing families destroyed. I'm so tired of seeing the, the enemy do his thing and the wreck and ruin he causes. I'm so tired of the words cancer and heart attack and death. I'm just ready to go home. It's going to be a place as well of a great reuniting. I know many of you have loved ones that are already there. And you're going to see them again. Because they had a forward-looking faith. Can you imagine the reunion? Let me give you this one last thought. If you have a forward-looking faith, you have something inside of you that drives you because of the decision you made. And here's what I want you to think about. These in Hebrews 11, they had a forward-looking faith, and it was not just this. Listen to me. Listen. It was not just a little prayer they prayed, and they tucked it away in their shirt pocket until the day they died. And they could pull it out like an insurance policy and say, Yep, I get to go to heaven. I prayed that prayer. I filled out the card. I raised my hand. I did that. I did that. If that's your idea of a forward-looking faith, you're going to miss heaven. A believer that really has a true faith in God. And listen to me. It's not about the name over to the door. It doesn't matter if you're Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Lutheran. Everybody just needs to be saved. Everybody needs to come to that decisive moment and trust Christ as your Savior. Repent of your sin and say, Lord, I trust you and what you did on the cross for me. I need you to be my Savior. And then that... Calling out to God, that crying out to God is followed by a drive that is birthed inside of you because Jesus comes to live inside of you and you start going a different direction in your life. Could I tell you that the reason I feel so heavy hearted about this subject is I've preached and preached and preached to people that it scares me to death. Even though you said in church Sunday after Sunday your faith is not real because the fruits are not there. Your life has not changed. You may have prayed a little prayer. You may have filled out a card. You may have gone through confirmation or been sprinkled or baptized or whatever you were. But if you don't have a faith that changes you from the inside out and takes you a new direction, you don't have what's real. And I wouldn't bank on that five minutes after I died. That's not Kevin. That's what the Bible says. Go to those verses from Revelation. One day, this is going to happen. A great white throne. Judgment is going to take place. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. And the earth and sky fled from His presence. But they found no place to hide. Listen to me. You are not going to be able to hide from Jesus. You're going to stand before Jesus. Every person is. 
Paul talked about the judgment seat of believers where you and I as believers, we're going to stand before Him at the judgment seat of Christ. We're not at this judgment. But we are going to be judged for everything that's taken place in our life since we've trusted Christ as our Savior. Do you know what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5? He said, I'm going to judge you. Jesus said, I'm going to judge you for every motive you have. It's not just what you do, it's why you do it. Our service, our motives, everything. But that's at the judgment seat of Christ. That's for believers. This is for unbelievers. The earth and sky fled from His presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And look at this. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life, was thrown into the eternal lake of fire. It's very simple. I want to ask you. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Because there's going to be a day that the book is going to be open. If your name's not there, five minutes after you die, you're going to be in hell. Look at these words of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel again. He said, not everybody that calls out to me, not everybody says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually what? So that takes care of that pocket salvation Raised my hand, filled out the card, baptized, everything. But my life didn't change. That takes care of that. Those that are truly going to go to heaven five minutes, going to be in heaven five minutes after they die, are those that do the will of God. He said on Judgment Day, let's put it in Life Point translation. There'll be many that say, Lord, Lord, we came to church. We endured Kevin. We, we went through the, the sermons. We, we, we did this. We did that. I served. and I, I, I sang. I, I worked with the children. I, I went on mission trips. I, I did all these things. I was religious. I agreed. I signed the card. And Jesus will reply, What? I don't even know who you are. I don't even know you. You can be religious but lost. You can be faithful but fooled. I want to leave here with two thoughts and I'll make them really quick. Look at these verse, this verse in 1 John. John is talking to believers just like are in this room. And he says, Dear children, walk with God. In other words, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when He returns or five minutes after you die, you'll be full of courage and not shrink back in shame. I am so burdened for families. I'm so burdened for the way that the devil's got people duped into the idea of thinking, I'm okay. Hell's for bad people. And what I'm doing isn't that big a deal. I prayed the prayer. I'm okay. And you're not okay. You mark my words. This community is going to get rocked one of these days. 
I believe with all my heart. There's too many parents playing the church game, acting like things are all right with their kids and not teaching them the difference of what it looks like to walk it out with Christ. Just go to church. It ain't that big a deal. Every kid's going to screw up. I'm telling you. If you're not teaching your kids to stay away from the stuff, what are you talking about? Well, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the day. You kidding me? We got we got parents in churches that think it's no big deal that your teenager goes out and parties on Friday night, drives drunk. And it's no big deal with you, parent. You're a fool. You are a class A idiot. And your children. You know, it's one thing for you to be stupid. It's another thing to lead your kids to be stupid. Jesus said, you say, Kevin, where are you getting that? Jesus. He said, it'd be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and be thrown into the depths of the sea than to lead your child astray. I think Jesus touched on the subject, don't you? It is a big deal. Moms, dads, are you even saved? Is, is Christ even in your life? Is He in your home? Are you teaching your children? Are you walking it out? It's not enough to come here. It's not my job. It's your job. Are they seeing you live as a person passionate for Christ? Because one day the book's going to be open. And not only are you going to give an account, but so is your child. And they ain't going to heaven on your faith, or grandma's faith, or grandpa's faith, or anybody else's faith. They've got to have their own personal forward-looking faith and trust in God. And I'm telling you, my heart is burdened. My heart is burdened for people that are just playing the church game. You're, you think, you think, oh, I'm okay. Hell's for bad people. No, there are going to be a lot of life point people in hell. I can tell you that. And there are going to be a lot of First Baptist people and a lot of Methodist people and a lot of Catholic people and a lot of on and on and on. I, I'm just telling you. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Your religion is not going to get you there. Do you have a relationship that's changed your life? Now some of you are getting puffy mad. I get it. It's all right. I just love you enough to share with you. You better quit playing the game because there is but a step between you and death. Read these verses real quick with me. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not a quite you already admitted you're a liar, you're you're you 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 you're not a good person. None of us have escaped it. We all sin, right? And here's the consequences of that. Apart from Christ, you're gonna die and go to hell. But God demonstrated Romans five verses eight and nine. His love toward us and the while we were still sinners before you ever made a move toward God. He sent His Son to die for you. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us. Nobody, Listen, God sends nobody to hell. If you go to hell, if somebody dies and goes to hell, you've got to go around the cross, around the conviction of the Holy Spirit, around God's love, around everything that He's done for you. You choose to go there. God sends nobody there. It's your choice. Nobody has to endure condemnation for eternity. Say this last verse with me. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son 
that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Think about it. Isn't that good? That means it doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter your sin. You can be forgiven. But you know what you got to get? You got to get humble enough to say, I need to be saved. Some of you are going to walk out here as prideful and as lost as when you came in. What a shame it would be when God says, Come to me. I want to save you. Would you bow with me?